Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone present please to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? We're going to move straight on to agenda item one, which is major transport infrastructure projects update. And I, before we move on to this section, I would like to invite any members to declare any interests relevant to this item. Does any members have any interests? No, good. So this is an evidence. Uh, ah. So I'll just do my usual and say uh, I'm the honorary president of uh, the Scottish uh, Public Association for Public Transport and honorary vice president of Rail Future UK. Indeed, in light of that, I am honorary vice president of Friends of the Far North Line. And John. To group in Rail and a member of the RMT Parliamentary Group. Thank you very much. So this evidence session is an update from the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work on the progress of the major transport infrastructure projects for which he is responsible. I'd like to welcome Keith Brand, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, and Michelle Rennie, the Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a short opening statement? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Convener, for the opportunity. Uh, once again, uh, thanks as well to the Committee for the opportunity to provide the update uh, to the Committee on the major transport projects which are in my portfolio. Uh, since the last appearance before this Committee, work has progressed on all the projects for which I'm responsible at some pace, with significant progress being made across these projects. First of all, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Routes, Balmeri to Tipperty project. As I've previously advised, the AWPR at 58 kilometres in length is the longest new roads project currently under construction in the UK. It's the equivalent of building a completely new road between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And when it's complete, it will provide substantial benefits across the whole of the North East, boosting our economy, increasing business and tourism opportunities, improving safety and cutting congestion, as well as improving opportunities for public transport facilities. In the statement I made to Parliament on the 22nd of March, I advised the following consultation or that following consultation with Transport Scotland's technical advisers, it would be prudent to anticipate a late autumn 2018 opening date. Whilst I fully appreciate the contractor's continued ambition to target a summer 2018 opening, Transport Scotland's technical advisers on site remain of the view that a late autumn 2018 opening may be more of a realistic date. And I also confirmed at that time that we would continue to work with the contractor to identify whether any further sections of new road could be opened in advance of the whole of the project. So I'd like to reassure the committee that where that is possible without impacting on the timetable for completion of the overall project, we will endeavour to ensure that those sections of road are opened. It works are progressing well and for example we saw the Balmedi and Black Dog junctions opened at the end of April and the beginning of May respectively uh, and works nearing completion on the River D crossing. Elsewhere in the project, work's progressing well, and we're now at the stage where we can start to consider plans for a suitable event to mark the opening of this very significant project, I think first proposed 65 years ago. I look forward to being able to provide further information on this event, the opening event, in due course. And meanwhile, I'd want to take the opportunity, if I can, convener, to thank those residing in the North East for their continued patience while these essential works are being undertaken. The A9 duelling programme continues to make significant strides forward with the news that the second section between Lunkerty and Passive Burnham is expected to be awarded in the summer. The contract for advanced tree clearing works for the A9 Lunkerty to Passive Burnham project is expected to be awarded early June with works commencing on site soon after this and that will help de-risk the main construction contracts ensuring this important seasonal work does not unnecessarily delay the overall construction programme. And draft orders for five of the remaining duelling schemes were recently published. These represent collectively 36 miles of the 80 miles to be duelled. It's expected that the draft orders for a further three duelling schemes will be published in the coming months. The duelling programme is one of the biggest transport infrastructure projects in Scotland's history. We remain committed to completing the work by 2025 and we remain on target to meet that commitment. Of course, that project's not just about the building of the road. Uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution, Derek Mackay, recently attended the launch of a tourism app being taken forward by Transport Scotland's A9 duelling team as part of the government's innovative CivTech challenge, which looks to new technology businesses to solve technological challenges. The Highland Discovery app has been developed to promote the less visited rural heartlands of Scotland 
and will help tourists navigate the many visitor attractions and facilities in and around the A9 corridor. And the app focuses on small community facilities and businesses and also includes an in-car audio channel offering Scottish stories and songs. Design work continues on the A96 dueling Inverness to Aberdeen programme. The work we are progressing includes a rolling programme of regular engagement with local communities and other stakeholders to ensure locals, road users and businesses affected by the work are kept fully informed. And more importantly, this will ensure the vital feedback we receive is taken into account as we develop our plans. So far, 11,500 people have visited public engagement events on the A96 dueling. And as part of that programme of engagement between 27th of February and 2nd of March, local communities and road users were able to view and comment on proposed changes to the options being developed for the 46 kilometre A96 dueling Hardmuir to Fockerber scheme. Nearly 1,400 people attended the drop-in sessions over four days and the feedback received was extremely important to the team as they continue the route options assessment process for this section of the A96 dueling. We're currently on target to identify a preferred route option later this year. And building on the early Meet the Team public engagement events held in November 2017 on the 42 kilometre A96 dueling east of Huntley to Aberdeen scheme, which were attended again by over 1,000 people, we expect to present the options under consideration to the local communities later in the year to allow them the opportunity to provide important feedback, which will help shape a preferred option, which we hope to identify in 2019. And along with our commitment to duel the A9 between Perth and Inverness by 2025, dueling the A96 will ensure the road network between all of Scotland's cities is of dual carriageway standard at least by 2030. Since the M8 bundle uh, project fully opened the traffic on the 1st of June, we've seen significant journey time savings across the Central Scotland motorway network. Finishing works are currently ongoing and are expected to be completed in the coming months. And the committee may be aware that part of the Lagan construction group went into administration on Monday the 5th of February. Lagan formed 20% of the construction joint venture charged with the delivery of that project on behalf of Scottish Roads Partnership. Ferrovial Agroman is the other partner, and the contract makes Ferrovial Agroman jointly and severally liable to Scottish Roads Partnership in respect of their obligations and liabilities, and the obligation is now on Ferrovial to deliver the outstanding construction works. Approximately 10 Lagan employees were working on the project at the time of administration. Five have moved on to new employment, and five have been re-employed through the project. Uh, Lagan is not part of the Scottish Roads Partnership, the DBFO company responsible for the ongoing maintenance of the project for the next 30 years. The administration will therefore have no impact on the operation of these roads. Uh, quickly on Presswick Airport, since the government purchased the airport in 2013, we've been clear that the airport must operate on a commercial basis at arm's length from both the Scottish Government and Ministers. That allows the senior management team at the airport the freedom to pursue the business opportunities that align with the strategic direction of the business. And it's my view that the airport is moving in the right direction. For instance, recent CAA figures show that in 2017, the airport recorded an increase in passenger numbers of over 3% to approximately 696,000 when compared with the equivalent 2016 figures. While that's a relatively modest increase, 3%, it clearly demonstrates a move in the right direction. The airport also recently performed well during the adverse weather, while conditions across the country were certainly challenging. Presswick has ever remained open and operational throughout the period, and also accepted a number of flight diversions from other airports, which are quite lucrative forms of business. I'm also pleased to hear the committee have taken up the offer I made to visit the airport, and I understand that's been arranged for the 4th of June. I think that will give the members a, a, a really good opportunity to tour the airport and to hear firsthand about the improvements that have been made. Uh, and finally, just to thank the committee for the opportunity to update you today and happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the first question is from Peter Chapman. And good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Michelle. Um, obviously, the biggest project, as you said, the AWPR, and uh, very close to my heart, uh, we desperately want to see it in place. It's going to be a huge boost to the economy, as you rightly say. But, uh, you know, we hear it's delayed again, and I would just like to explore with you uh, some of the reasons why it has been delayed from spring of this year to autumn of this year. So, uh, if, could you inform us of what the, the reasoning behind that delay is? Yeah, I think the reasons um, uh, are really those which are set out in the statement to Parliament. So the reasons, um, which includes largely the reasons given to us by the contractor, include 
weather effects, in particular Storm Frank, which um, I'm sure the member knows was hugely, uh, had a huge impact in the northeast. Um, people that live in the northeast said they'd never seen a storm like that. Um, many people say for um, a period of months in some areas that some of the ground that was being worked on was absolutely inaccessible because of flooding, so that had a major impact on that. The contractor also says um, they've uh, experienced delays in uh, achieving utility diversions. That's one of the reasons that they've given, and also they've mentioned the fact that the uh, collapse of Carillion has had an impact on the supply chain. So these are the reasons given by the contractor. Um, the dates which were set out were those set out by the contractor. We let the contract, obviously, and those were the dates that they uh, provided. And uh, as you say, it's regrettable that it could not be done earlier, but having first been proposed 65 years um, ago, I think it's good that we're now at the stage on a huge project. If you think about a motorway the length of uh, the motorway between Edinburgh and Glasgow, that's the size of the project, the biggest in the UK. And I think you will also know, I'm sure, from your own local observations, the extent to which the road is getting very near completion as well. But there are other processes that we have to go through, things like a road audit before the um, different sections of road can be formally open to the public. So we are advised by the contractor that good progress is being made. I should say that they also stick to their um, their estimate of summer, but we are sticking to what we believe is um, a more realistic date of late autumn. I, I noticed the, on your opening statement you, you slipped in the, the word late, late autumn, because I think in the last time we discussed this, autumn was, the, was, the, was the, the term you used. Now, late autumn to me means that there's still huge concern. Uh, it would tell me that the, there's a more slippage in, in the system. And you're just softening us up for a, another uh, announcement sometime soon that it's it's uh, delayed again. I mean that was quite a, you know revealing to me that you did say late autumn, and I think the last time you were in front of this committee it was autumn. So can we be sure that that this broad will be open in 2018? I I think you overestimate my willingness or um, I ability to manipulate the committee um, in that way. Um, but no, I, I'm sure I mentioned when I spoke to Parliament in the statement late autumn. That's not to suggest I think it will necessarily be late autumn. Um, the, the contractor is still saying to us, both sides of the contract partnership, as they believe they can do this by the summer. We think it's quite an aggressive pro um, programme they have to achieve that. And we're also keen to make sure this road is done safely. So we have said um, autumn. It's not because I think it will be late autumn, but that's what I'd said previously, I'm sure, in my statement to Parliament. So we will try and complete this as quickly as possible. We'll also try and open parts of the road as quickly as possible. There's no attempt to soften up the committee. We want to get this road done as soon as possible. We're well aware, as you yourself have pointed out, of the huge benefits that incrementally it will produce as different parts of the road open. So there's no attempt to soften up the committee here. We, we want to get this road done as quickly as possible. That's, that's good, I, and, and I'm sure everybody does want to get the open as, as quickly as possible. There's one other issue I do need to big, bring up, and, and you know, we welcome the fact that the Belmiri Tipperary bit is, is opened, even though it's single track either way. But there is an issue there, and, and the issue that I need to bring up is signage. Uh, there are local businesses, and there's one business in particular that has, has had huge problems since the opening of that part of the road. They are all, almost marooned on the, on the old A90. The signage is absolutely unacceptable. This is a business that it's a, it's a, it's a hotel restaurant business, and it's seen an absolute plummet in its, in its uh, uh, clientele in the last few days, simply because folk kind of find it. And it, uh, you know, I, I went in past it on, on Monday on my way down here, and I missed the turn off, and it meant that a, a 10 mile detour all the way to Balmeri and all the way back, and, and, and eventually found the, the way in. And it is hard for somebody that knows the area, anybody that doesn't know the area. So, what's happening is that their, their, their business has fallen off a cliff, and it's simply down to the, the, a, a lack of suitable signage to allow folk to find the place. And I think we need to be aware of that because there will be other bits of the road opening to, uh, in a similar manner, I assume, over the next weeks and months. We need to get this signage far better. You know, these, these are businesses that are really to suffering. Times are tough anyway, and, you know, this is making a huge difference. So um, I implore you to take that on board. I have been speaking to the, the, the AGL guys in the last few days. They promised they will um, improve the signage, but it hasn't happened yet. So, I'm... I'm, I'm tempted to say this is more of a constituency mm. question 
and, and therefore it may be something that you want to take up with the Cabinet Secretary afterwards. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary has taken on board the importance of signage and maybe just for the record you could acknowledge the fact that signage is important and then we could perhaps move on to the other questions. Well, I will be very brief, convenient. It is a consistency matter which the member has raised with me. It was looked at last night by not just the contractors, but Transport Scotland, and we'll get back to you on their findings in due course. Thank you, Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the next question is Stuart Stevenson. Um, I've just got a wee sneaky one. The new road will be called the A90. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, right. That's fine. <laughs> just, uh, it's something I've not heard before, although maybe I have. Um, one of the issues that uh, has, uh, of course, engaged us that the uh, Cabinet Secretary referred to in opening remarks as the collapse of one of the partners uh, to this project, Karelian. Um, and we've seen widespread effect in the public sector, perhaps particularly south of the border, on Karelian-led projects. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary think that the approach the Scottish Government took, uh, which uh, has seem to have largely protected this project from the collapse. Is that one from which we can learn lessons or indeed uh, other governments uh, in the UK could learn lessons? Uh, I think it's uh, certainly the case that the way that we've constructed the contracts and in this case with three partners in the um, partnership which is delivering the um, project has been very helpful in as far as if one um, partner does, if you like, fall by the wayside in the way that Carillion has, then the other two project um, contractors are jointly and severally in the legal language uh, obliged to take that up. So it doesn't come back to the public contracting authority uh, in that sense. And I think that has been good. However, I would also say that I think we are duty bound to look at what lessons we can learn from this as well. So the, it's a very large project and it was only uh, or the successful bid was from three very large companies. I think there's also an issue about the extent to which we make sure that Scotland's SME sector is able to access um, these kind of contracts as well. So Transport Scotland are doing some work on that just now. So although we can feel quite, um, I think, um, satisfied at the way that the contracts have been constructed in protecting the public purse and the progress of the project, I think we should nevertheless um, take some uh, whatever lessons we can from what's happened in this particular situation and see if we can apply those to future projects. Um, I note uh, press comment today, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that 78% of uh, public contracts in Scotland uh, go to SMEs. Uh, is there scope for increasing that number, particularly in your area of interest? Although I imagine that uh, most projects will be led by uh, large, large companies. Well, I think if you think about this particular project, you had a situation where one of the main contractors, Carillion, itself established subsidiary companies, uh, particularly in relation to contract staff and in relation to a transport uh, fleet provision. Uh, and I'm not sure that really is in the spirit of SMEs. So I think it's that kind of thing we do want to look at. But you're right to say that the bulk of this work will end up with subcontractors and the bulk of that will be with SMEs. And I think given that we have 98% of our businesses in Scotland are SMEs, I think we really want to see if we can increase that proportion from the, the figure that you mentioned. Um, right, just a, a slightly different thing, which I think we can probably deal with relatively briefly. Um, I understand that Aberdeenshire Council is asking the contracting consortium uh, for help to deal with repairs on local roads uh, because a lot of the traffic uh, that would have been on the A90 has gone up really quite uh, local roads. Uh, is the government involved in that discussion at all and uh, are, are we in a position to make any comment on what we think the expected outcome might be? Uh, the government's involved to the extent that we occasionally get correspondence about it, but I think, as the question suggests, that really is a relationship between the contractor and the local roads authority, and there are often private agreements that are reached between the two, so no, the government doesn't have a direct input to that, and we know that there is discussion between both um, local authorities and the contractors in relation to local roads, but that is a matter for the two parties concerned, not for the government. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you've got a brief question. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> in a uh, debate in the Chamber uh, a few months ago uh, uh, around uh, future technology on, on travelling on roads, the, I think it was the Transport, sec uh, Transport Minister admitted that, the, for example, the M8, M73, M74 hadn't been particularly 
uh, future-proofed in that respect. Whilst it was very fit for purpose for current car usage, uh, there hadn't really been thought given to things like dynamic lane or speed management, electric charging points, uh, or lane usage for autonomous vehicles, for example. Uh, in terms of the AWPR project or any other large road infrastructure projects that the Cabinet Secretary is looking after, how much future-proofing has gone in to these large investment projects to ensure that they are fit for purpose uh, in light of tomorrow's potential technology? I think that's probably something that would be good to hear from Michelle from, but I would say that in each of these projects, whether it was the M8 bundle, um, if you think about the actual layout or geography of that road, or if you think about the A9 or uh, the AWPR, these all involve expansions in capacity and the footprint of the road. So by definition, they're more flexible in order to take forward future developments. But some of these projects were quite a number of years um, old in the design, if you like, and they should be as adaptable as possible. I think they will be because they are, uh, as I say, represent expansions. If you have, for example, on the A9, a dual carriageway as opposed to a single carriageway, then it's more able to take uh, adaptations to it to accommodate uh, some of the things that you've mentioned. And of course, it's our ambition for the A9 to be uh, the kind of electric avenue that will be able to have charging points along its length. But I don't know if Michelle wants to come back in on that. As the, as the Cabinet Secretary said, um, significant work is underway on the A9 to look at um, the provision of charging points and the like. Um, across all of our schemes, we include provision for um, uh, an intelligent transport system to be able to give uh, immediate um, online, real-time driver information to drivers as they're on the network. And the likes of the Fourth River Creasement Crossing makes provision for a managed motorway where we can, um, where we can, uh, you know, um, control the amount of traffic, the volume of traffic going on and off that section of the network. So all of that helps to alleviate congestion, improves journey time reliability and the like. Going forward, we will continue to look at what adaptations that we can make to our future schemes. However, as members will appreciate, um, the uh, Preparation and uh, the statutory processes for these schemes take some years. Technology is currently moving at a pace, but um, nothing has been arrived at uh, as, a, as a conclusive measure for the use of uh, autonomous vehicles or, or the use of new technology. So we are continuing to work with partners right across the world to look at where that might end up, but we don't want to prejudge the outcome of that work. Uh, just before we leave the AWPR, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned there were problems with utility diversions. I think that was in November last year. Could you just explain what, what the issues were there? I mean, I'm assuming the utilities have been there for some time and the planning for their removal should have been undertaken at the beginning. I just don't understand why it would be a delay. No, I, I didn't mention um, that we had problems with utility diversions. What I was saying was that the contractor in saying why they've delayed has mentioned uh, utility diversions. And you're right, Convener, what we did, um, and I would say at that time, unusually, at the start of that project, I gathered together all the utility providers in a meeting in Aberdeen and said to them we wanted to make sure there was no question of any delays. If you remember as well, at that time, we were in the teeth of the Edinburgh tram uh, situation, and that had by far been the biggest issue there. People didn't know what they were going to find when they dug up the roads of Edinburgh. So I got the utility uh, companies together to say we have to make sure this is done as quickly as possible. We had a whole day event uh, on it in Aberdeen, which at that time was quite unusual. However, the contractors believe they've had issues in terms of utility diversion, so we're investigating that currently. Indicate which utility it was. I think the one that sticks out in my mind, I don't think it is just one, but the one that sticks out in my mind would have been the one, the oil pipeline was, was a big issue for them and getting the permission from the utility provider in that case was an issue. And we, once they mentioned that to us and it's their responsibility to get those utility diversions, uh, I did intervene on their behalf with the provider to try and ask for things to be hurried up in relation to that. I think I reported that previously to the committee, in fact. Um, 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 I would have to refer back to the record. I, I just think it's interesting you say that you, you tried to head it off at the pass and it, and it, and it had, uh, had failed, but I mean, these things happen. I think the next question is on a uh, new subject, and uh, that's Conan. And, and good morning to the panel. Can, can I turn to um, the issue of, of Presswick Airport, which you, you touched on in your 
opening comments, Cabinet Secretary. Can you provide the committee with um, an update on the current level of Scottish Government financial support for the airport, uh, including the total loans to date, uh, expected loans for future financial years, uh, and when you anticipate the airport will break even and begin to pay those loans back? I think we've said since the very start, um, at that time we enjoyed a relative consensus in the Parliament on the Government's move to take ownership of the uh, airport, although we don't have that consensus any longer, I don't think. We did mention it was going to be a long-term um, recovery for the airport, and the reason for that was, of course, that so little investment had been carried out previously that a great deal of work had to be uh, done to get the airport back into the correct state. So the committee, I think, have reported previously um, has... Uh, um, invest, the investment in the airport is done on a commercial basis in the form of loan funding and that attracts a market rate of interest in line with state aid rules. The last financial year we provided loan support of £8 million to the airport. By the end of March this year we had therefore provided a total, if you roll that together with previous years, of £30. £8.4 million pounds to the airport in loan funding, and the budget for 2018-19 allocates further loan support of up to £7.9 million, pounds, meaning there's a potential total loan funding of £46.3 million pounds to the end of March 2019. Uh, we've also made clear, I think, in previous statements to the Parliament that uh, further loan funding may be required for Presswick Airport. Any confirmed facility would need to be based on a robust business case and subject to the availability, of course, of necessary budget provision. We have not set a time limit, just to come back to the Member's points about the uh, return to profitability or for the repayment of the loan support provided, but we have said that is what we intend to achieve, but we have not set a time scale for that. Thanks for that. Um, one of the issues at the moment is obviously the current pay dispute um, involving workers at Presswood Airport. Do, do you think, given the, the scale of the financial input, given the fact that the Scottish Government are the main shareholder in Presswick, it's appropriate that, that staff at Presswick are being offered a pay rise which is below the Government's own public sector pay policy and the airport still doesn't pay the living wage? Yeah, I think the... Uh, I won't comment on any particular dispute, but I think um, when, when we say the words that the airport... Uh, operates a, a commercial move from the government, there has to be some meaning to that. There has to be the basis on which the airport has, is able to take those decisions. But the airport, uh, you know, I think as the member implies, also has to be aware of the Scottish Government's um, position on the living wage. So my understanding is that they currently pay the national living wage and it is their intention to move to the living wage. And I'm sure the member will be aware that uh, the way that these things are approached by the Living Wage Foundation uh, and by the Poverty Alliance, who carry out much of this work, is that it's not necessarily the case that everybody that they speak to will be paying a living wage at day one, but they will have a plan for moving towards paying a living wage. Um, and that is, uh, as I understand it, the intention of the airport uh, to do that, I think, uh, by 2020. But Cabinet Secretary, the government are the, the main shareholder in, in Presswood Airport, and this is a government-owned company that doesn't pay the living wage. Surely that's wrong. You, you mentioned the fact that it's an arm's length company, but you're on public record, rightly in my view, criticising the UK government for failing to intervene on the proposed RBS bank closures. Uh, and the point you made in Parliament was that the fact that the UK government were the main shareholder in RBS and they should be intervening. So why aren't the Scottish government intervening to make sure that staff at Presswick are being paid the living wage? I think I've explained, convener, as best I can. I don't know any other ways to state it. It has to operate, it has to do so by state aid rules and the basis on which the airport was bailed out at commercial remove. Uh, I think it is a commercial remove from the Scottish Government, but it is the case, as with many other organisations, and the member mentions UK government uh, or, or other companies which maybe don't pay the living wage. In each case, I'd be very pleased if those companies which currently didn't pay the living wage had a plan to get to the stage where they did pay the living wage, as Presswick does, and I'm pleased that they're doing that. Uh, their legal requirement, as you know, is that they pay a national living wage. Far better, of course, and I know the member and I differ on this point, if this parliament had the ability to insist on payment of a real living wage, and then, of course, this question wouldn't arise. There's a few people uh, wanting to come in, uh, and some some people. Richard, you were next, um, and I'd like to just. I've got Gail, um, Mike, and John. If it's on the living wage, if we can stay on this. Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to bring I'm going to bring John Finney in, and then come to you, Richard. You will come. Thank you. Uh, 
John. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, good morning. Morning, uh, Ms Rennie. Just to f pick up on the points uh, raised by my colleague uh, Colin Smith there, and uh, quite unusual to hear you commending the national living wage, which of course is short of the real living wage we would want here. But what I, I find confusing is you're using the term, if I noted you correctly, um, um, commercially removed shortly after detailing the tens of millions of pounds that the Scottish Government's providing. I, th I think there has to be a moral responsibility as we've raised issues about funding going to companies that have historically blacklisted or don't treat their staff well. Is there an opportunity to revisit this, commercially removed or not, to have a situation where we don't have people who quite legitimately are presumed to be Scottish Government employees not in receipt of the, the real living wage, Cabinet Secretary? I don't recall commending the national living wage, um, but I've obviously checked the official report in relation to that. I don't think the national living wage is what people should be paid. I think it should be the real living wage, which is what I said in the response um, to Mr Smith. And we want to see as many people as possible. Of course, in Scotland we have, I think, 81.6% of employees paid uh, the real living wage, which is the highest of any of the countries in the UK, and we want to keep driving that up. And I want to see the airport paying that living wage, and they have a plan to do that. That's what's important. And you'll know the way that these things work is um, it's very often the case when the Living Wage Foundation go in to speak to uh, organisations to encourage them to pay the living wage, what they are interested in doing is getting to a stage where it's paid. And sometimes that there's a process to achieve that. And that's what Presswick are uh, undergoing. And in relation to the fact that the government has built um, a, a, out the airport, as has been said, yes, we did that because hundreds of people would have lost their jobs. In fact, depending on the assessment that you took, thousands of people would have lost their jobs. So we've done that to save jobs in the first place. But having put the money in, the capital monies that have gone in to try and help turn the airport around, we are at a move from the commercial decisions which the airport make. So, yes, there's a moral responsibility here. We will continue to put the moral and the economic argument for payment of real living wage, and I'm pleased that Presswick at least have recognised that by the plan they have to move to paying everybody the real living wage. You, you don't see any leverage connected with um, the, 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 the monies that you do put over? Because a lot well, of people would presume that that would be significant leverage. You'll get this, presuming that you meet the legitimate terms and conditions we would expect of Scottish Government employees. I think that, as you say, there is uh, moral and um, other leverage um, in terms of the arguments we're making. We've done that over a period of time with Presswick. I'd like to think that was part of what helped Presswick get to the place they are at now, where people will be paid the real living wage. Um, I think it's by 2020 they intend to do it. And I meet with the non-executive members of the board next week and again I'll put these um, uh, arguments to them. I think there's a not just a moral case, there is a moral case for paying somebody a, a wage they can live on but there's also an economic benefit to companies doing that as well. Can I get, move on to Richard? Richard. Yes, um, you know I, I've said in the past I believe that Presswick is the jewel and uh, our crown and basically we should do as much as we can to support it. But I note also from the comments he made earlier, passing, yes, passenger numbers are up 24,008 people on last year, but they've actually fallen 216,331 since 2014. So you've also said that this airport is open in bad weather, it can cope with uh, other things. So what are we doing to, and you're going to meet the board next week, we're going to visit it, I look forward to visiting the 4th of June, and, and I'll be pressing these points. What is the board doing to encourage more air uh, freight, more aircraft? Uh, it's only been operated by Ryanair, and as I said before, I was in it one Thursday night at 11 o'clock, and I was the only person of the public in that building on that night uh, before a flight came in. Um, so what we're we doing to improve and encourage people to go to Presswick and airlines to operate out of Presswick? Sorry for the long rant. To answer that, there's an ancillary <coughs> question which links into that from the Deputy <coughs> Convener. I'd like to just bring her in, if I may, at this stage. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, Michelle, Cabinet Secretary, comes right on the back of Richard Lyle's question. Um, in February, Ryanair announced it was closing its base in Glasgow and it was reducing its flights from 23 to 3. Should we not be seeing that as an opportunity, as Richard says, to be increasing the flights out of um, Presswick, given that it's Ryanair in question? Yeah, I think on the last point uh, raised by Gail Ross, if you go back uh, two or three years, then the reverse situation occurred, where Glasgow would have felt that Presswick were 
taking, if you like, business away from Glasgow. And, and these things, people know that Ryanair move around quite a bit. They've also had major uh, cutbacks at Edinburgh, then reinstated many of those and additional um, uh, routes as well. So that is part of the extremely competitive nature of what um, airports, uh, and uh, in Scotland, the airport sector is extremely healthy. Um, and yes, if it's an opportunity there, then it is for the boards and those that work at the airport to make sure they exploit those opportunities. And to come back to uh, Richard Lyle's point, of course, that's the ability of the members that will carry the visit to ask the board directly what they are doing. But from what I know the board is doing, yes, there is uh, a lot of work done on providing incentive packages for new routes and new business to come in from passengers. And yes, they're finding that difficult to do. There's no question of that. However, they are seeing substantial success in terms of maintenance operations with um, uh, the company Chevron on site uh, and operating at capacity. They are taking flights which are diverted from elsewhere, which is very lucrative. They're also uh, getting more business in terms of fueling for, for aircraft as well. So it's always been the case that Presswick doesn't have quite the same composition as uh, Glasgow and um, Edinburgh and other airports in Scotland, they have other things that they can offer and they've sought to increase, as they have done, uh, the business they have in these other areas as well. But there is no question there is real pressure in terms of passenger traffic and it would be best, I think, if individual members of the committee take the chance and they, they meet the board to find out in more detail what they're doing to try and address that. As, uh, thank you, Kenyon. As This is a, a wholly owned item with the Scottish Government and separate from the, the owners who own other airports. There are landing fees. Can, can the likes of Perth, Presswick undercut Glasgow and uh, Edinburgh on landing fees to encourage uh, more airlines to go there? Yeah, I think you'll find that um, all airports um, can, they have discretion in terms of landing fees and they can use that as a package to um, try and attract new routes. That's fairly common practice within the industry. But that is, is again, a decision for the board and it goes with, they can offer marketing support. Um, we do have to be, and quite rightly, the Scottish Government has to be, if you like, agnostic between the airports. So if we were to be involved in a package supporting um, uh, a new route coming to Scotland, we'd have to be neutral as between which airports. So you'll have seen the work that we've done to get direct flights to China, Edinburgh, and a number of flights at uh, Glasgow and Aberdeen as well. So we don't just support Presswick Airport, but we can support them as well as other airports. Thank you. Thanks, Good morning. I'd like to pursue the questioning on the loan, the information that you've just given us this morning about the loans to Prestwick. You told, just told us that up to now it's £38 million and that there's another £8 million coming down the line which takes us to over £46 million. And you've also told us that the Scottish Government, although it owns it, operates arm's length, and it's, these are commercial decisions the, the board makes. So I'm a bit puzzled why we're ploughing, or the Scottish Government, just ploughing another £8 million of taxpayers' money into Prestwick Airport. Obviously, if it's making commercial decisions, then they should be able to raise money commercially. Um, is it the case that they can't do that, or is this just a case of a, a taxpayer's money pit and are we going to be loaning even more money? Uh, well, we are going to be uh, loaning more money. I've mentioned the potential total loan funding, um, additional loan funding for next year. Beyond that, it will be, of course, according to budgets. Uh, and yes, it is the case initially they couldn't raise that money elsewhere. Infratil, when they sold uh, the airport, sold it to the Scottish Government for a pound. And that, I think, tells you quite a bit about the financial situation that the airport was in. Um, and I think whenever we do make these loans, we make sure it's for, for example, I mentioned about the condition of the airport and for those that have been to the airport before it was bought by the Scottish Government and since then, you will see the change in the infrastructure that's there uh, round about the hotel, especially at the front of the, the, the airport uh, and in the uh, main passenger area at the front as well. So. It was, there was a huge backlog of work to be done in terms of maintenance and improvement of the airport, and a lot of the money that's been drawn down has been drawn down for that purpose. Um, so uh, realising capital assets. And it may well be that um, future loan funding helps to provide further facilities. So hangar space, um, there's, of course, the open question of a spaceport. Presswick's uh, in the running to be um, designated as a, or win a licence for, for a spaceport as well. So um, it is a different kind of airport from other airports. We do provide the funding and, yes, they struggled, uh, would have struggled to get uh, funding from other commercial sources, although the money that we loan is loaned on commercial terms. I just follow that up by just asking, and if that's the case, it can't raise this money commercially. Um, 
and it's come to the Scottish Government for this money and you're, you're loaning it to them on commercial terms. That's a concern to me because as a, uh, thinking about the taxpayer, what, what position, if you could give us an idea, when do you think the taxpayer will get this money back, if ever? Oh, that's my question, really. Well, our intention, and we've said that from the start, is that the taxpayer will get this money back, and I suppose there's two ways that that can happen. One is um, if uh, we can get the situation where we turn it around, such as the income is coming in, and we're getting the money back because we're having to pay the money back uh, just now. That's the, loan, um, the basis of the loan. They have to repay it on commercial terms. But if they can then uh, get the business through that allows them to pay that over the term of the loan, then we get the money back at that stage. And far more besides the continuing employment of hundreds of people and hundreds of others uh, that are reliant on uh, the airport for their livelihoods. And the second way, of course, is if it was to be the case that the airport was purchased by somebody else, we would make sure that the taxpayers' interests were looked after in that eventuality as well. Uh, Jamie. The Cabinet Secretary said that um, things are heading in the right direction. Uh, uh, in your opening statement. But since the government took ownership of the airport uh, in the last four years, passenger numbers have fallen, uh, aircraft movement numbers have fallen, and freight volumes have fallen. So the Cabinet checks it, says that more money may be made available if he's happy that there is a st successful strategic plan in place. But given the uh, relative lack of success and progress so far, uh, how confident is the Cabinet Secretary that the current structures and strategies in place are heading in the right direction and will actually be able to turn the airport around because on the face of it, it doesn't seem to be doing so to date. No, I, I think that uh, the member rightly points to the fact that if you look at the trajectory once the government had bought the airport, they were losing passenger traffic hand over fist, they were losing routes, uh, they were losing freight traffic and they, it's bound to have continued on that trajectory but what I'm seeing is I think we're seeing um, uh, increases. I've mentioned the increase in passenger traffic. Um, I've mentioned the fact the increases in, in freight traffic. Uh, they've also, I think, got a much more business-focused approach to it. I, I think Infratil had other interests as well as Presswick Airport. We've now got a very focused um, approach in Presswick Airport. So, uh, and I think some of the, the, the uh, we, we have satisfied ourselves in terms of the strategic case that's been made by the airport. But of course, individual members will get the chance, and I, I think the member maybe has taken the chance already as well, to ask directly the board of their plans to do that. And yes, we believe this is worth investing in, and the benefits to Scotland uh, are worth our investment at the level that I've mentioned. Um, that, that being said, I, I'm aware that uh, you know, there are opportunity, commercial opportunities there for the airport, airport to grow, uh, specific around uh, private aviation, which is often uh, purported as to be one of the, the elements where the airport could um, uh, see growth. Uh, there is a problem there, however, in that uh, the airport is not allowing private operators to come in to the airport to run their businesses. A lot of the companies that were there when the state ownership uh, came into place uh, and effectively lost their businesses because of the state aid rules. These companies still want to use Presswick Airport and come back to Presswick Airport to provide competitive services such as ground handling uh, services to what's already been offered to customers. And the la lack of competition is in fact uh, inhibiting uh, the growth in jet aviation at the airport. And I appreciate there's an arm's length situation there, but can I press on the Cabinet Secretary to take that up with the management team that they should and ought be more flexible to private companies in, uh, coming to the airport and reinvesting in it, uh, especially the ones who used to be there before uh, the public took ownership? Uh, no, I can't do that. I mean, I think the particular case that the member mentions was a, a contractual decision taken by the airport for reasons which they uh, have to satisfy themselves are commercially sound. And from the information, because the issue was raised by other people at the time, and I looked into it at the time, they're both entitled to take that decision and I think convinced that was the best commercial decision for the airport. But I do not get any sense that they are turning away uh, private sector business, including um, private jets. I think they are doing that. And if you look at the investment by, uh, I've mentioned Chevron already, and other companies, they are quite open. And if the, if the committee members have suggestions to the boards uh, and the executives about further opportunities, I would expect they would want to take those up. So I, I can't really comment on the individual contractual case that's mentioned, but I, I am satisfied that there's a very welcoming approach to the private sector, and there should be, and of course the committee can further satisfy themselves about that when they meet with the board directly. Stuart, got a question on this? 
I, I just wonder if it would be helpful in uh, connection with the question we've just had, if the um, Cabinet Secretary can confirm the remains of pli private flying base. There's a light aircraft maintenance company on there. Uh, business aviation uh, aircraft uh, is welcome, and that both Avgas LL100 and Avtour JP4 uh, are available, thus uh, providing all the facilities that uh, private aircraft might require at an airport. I'd forgotten about Avg 2P4, but um, yes, I mean, these things are here. And I, I think I mentioned earlier on that these are, especially in terms of refueling, these are very lucrative activities for the airport. Uh, as it is, if a, if a plane is diverted from another airport because of weather reasons to Presswick, that's lucrative business for the airport. They're very well aware of that. I did have a suggestion before we took over that they might want to, you know, brand themselves as something as a, of a resilience airport for that very purpose. Uh, that also uh, would require capital investment. And there are other things which the airport does, which the committee members can ask about when they meet with them directly, which are probably not best for the public domain, about um, the different um, facilities at the airport. But there's no, uh, nothing in my mind that says that the company, uh, the board, are turning away private business. In fact, exactly the reverse, they're keen to welcome it. OK, um, we're going to leave that definitely there and move on to Kate with the next question. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, take the questions on to the Queen's Ferry Crossing now and ask if the Cabinet Secretary could provide an update on progress in completing the minor works on the crossing which were highlighted in Michelle Rennie's letter to the committee in January. Uh, well, Michelle's here, but uh, the snagging works which are mentioned and which I've mentioned at previous committee meetings uh, are in progress. Um, of course, it's the case that uh, key members of the previous consortium left when the completion of the crossing itself, in terms of its opening at least, um, uh, happened. And that, to some extent, marked um, the transfer, if you like, of responsibility for the, the crossing from myself to Hamza Yosef. It's now an operational road, so he has those responsibilities. But uh, from memory, I think the uh, snagging works and other works that we've done have to be completed by September, and that's in progress. Very much. Wonder, oh, sorry. Do you, do, Kate, do you want? Are you pushing on the actual snagging list of where it is, or, or I mean, I, I, I get confused, cabinet section. It'd be quite helpful that we, when we ask um, the the dividing between Hamza Youssef and you on this, until the work is actually complete, uh, my understanding is it still falls within your portfolio, um, and that's Hamza's uh, position on it. So, I mean, I was just com confused about whether Michelle would be in a position to give us an update on the actual snagging. Kate, was that, sorry, but I, I don't mean to cut across your bows. Would it, would it be useful to have a position of where we are on, on the items? I think what, what we provided to you was a list of target dates that the contractor um, gave us. Uh, and I think we described at that time that none of those dates were... Um, contractually binding other than the September date. So I think what we can see is that snagging works are um, progressing and uh, that they are intending to be complete by September. Maybe it'd be possible for the committee, I think your letter is dated the 8th of January 2018 uh, with the snagging list, maybe it'd be helpful to the committee to have an updated list uh, of where we are on all the snagging issues that were referred to in that letter. Um, I mean, it, just sorry, Kate, before we come back, is, is that there are issues that when you come over the bridge, say, on the 7th of May and the 21st of May, we're back to one lane travel again. You know, one of those is a bank holiday day. Um, you know, I have to say, reducing the bridge to one lane on both directions on a bank holiday perhaps seems an odd day to do it to me, but it'd be quite useful um, to have a updated list for the committee. Sorry, Kate. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, in terms of the uh, the other, the fourth road bridge, um, which is now a public and active travel facility, as I understand, there have been some talk of uh, car drivers continuing to use that bridge. What are Transport Scotland, Amy, and Police Scotland doing to ensure that's not the case? Um, you're quite right, that's the designation of that bridge and that was always the intention, in fact, in legislation that it would be a public transport corridor. And it's worth just pointing out, um, 
that um, the traffic which uses that, including buses, has legal ability to travel on the new crossing as well if they choose to do that. But the advantage would be there's far less traffic on uh, the bridge. And we have had the reverse happen where some car drivers have <coughs> wrongly used the, the public transport corridor. So we've reflected a bit on how it's working. And the company which operates it on the process of enhancing the existing signing just to make sure that where it's happening, it's not happening because of any confusion that might be in the minds of drivers, just to provide additional clarity uh, and to support the compliance with its public transport corridor uh, designation. And that work is programmed by the end of this month and early next month. Of course, the police always have the ability to enforce these restrictions and they will continue to monitor and patrol the Force Road Bridge uh, where operational demands allow. And I think they've taken, I think, a very considered and sensible approach to it so far. But, you know, it's not going to be a continuing excuse for people to say they're unaware of the, the restrictions that are on, on the bridge. But there is there has obviously been a period of change that, that we're going through just now. And the additional signage, I think, will help that situation. There's no not penalties for on drivers for using the wrong bridge. There's not penalties yeah, for no, car drivers. Yeah. That if are, they're charged by the police, then yes, I'll be friendly with that. Great. Um, going back to, there's a piece in the Herald today around uh, a contractor court cases. I don't know if you've been able to see it yet. And I wondered if um, the Scottish Government was aware of these cases and whether it was likely to be involved in any way. Uh, we are aware of them, but no, these are, I think, um, a disputes, not unusually, to be honest, uh, between different elements of the contracting partners involved in it, and that's really for those contracting partners to resolve between themselves, but we're not aware, and it will not have an impact on the budgets um, for the, the bridge. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question, then, is uh, John. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, moving to another subject, which would be high-speed rail, HS2. Uh, we understand there have been some discussions between Transport Scotland, Government, uh, Network Rail, HS2 and so on about once uh, there is high-speed rail to Manchester and Leeds, I think, how that will impact in Scotland and how we move forward from that. Are you able to give us any updates on that or comments? Hey, I, I can to some extent. So I had um, uh, conversations with the Secretary of State for Transport, I think the last time directly was, was last year. And I've made the point consistently to the UK government that simply saying there'll be benefits from high-speed rail south of the border uh, and that Scotland might benefit from that is not uh, the benefit that we are seeking or the sole benefit. So we've made the case that high-speed uh, rail will have to come to Scotland. And if you think of either the East Coast or the West Coast mainline, the West Coast mainline in particular, on which around £9 billion was spent just a few years ago to upgrade it, now substantially at capacity, if you improve high-speed rail to the Midlands and don't improve it beyond that, you're still going to have those choke points. And the only way we can see to resolve that, and the work has been done jointly with ourselves and the UK government, is to if at least introduce elements of high-speed rail north of the border. So um, there's been a joint working group which is called the North of HS2 to Scotland Working Group, and it comprises the partners which the member mentioned. Um, it's prioritised a short list of potential infrastructure enhancements on both the East and the West Coast main lines uh, that merit further study. And we've commissioned ourselves a feasibility study into two of the better performing options amongst those which have been previously identified by the work already carried out to help improve jet train journey times, capacity, resilience and reliability on services between uh, Scotland and England. And the studies will focus on the East Coast Line south of Dunbar towards Newcastle, the West Coast Line between Glasgow and Carstairs. And our arguments with, our arguments to the UK Government are underpinned by the UK Government's own commitment. I think it was um, Patrick McLaughlin as Transport Secretary spoke to his party conference and said it would be a three hour you're committed to a three-hour journey time between Edinburgh, Glasgow and London. Now, you cannot achieve that, um, in our view, and that's not challenged without elements of high-speed rail in Scotland. So we're using that as a basis for our discussions with the UK government. So if I'm understanding you correctly, there would be different kind of stages in this, uh, in that if there's elements of high-speed rail in Scotland, or at least north of Manchester and Leeds, uh, this, the high-speed trains would be able to come all the way to Glasgow and Edinburgh but at varying speeds. I mean, I think one of the fears has been that they would actually be going slower through Cumbria, I guess, and the south of Scotland, where there's a lot of bends and so on, than the present West Coast trains, which are designed for that route. Um, 
So is, is, am I have a correct understanding that that is the interim solution, but in the longer term, we do want full, proper high-speed rail all the way to Scotland? Uh, exactly right. So we've said that. Um, but what, what we can, I think, reasonably be expected to hold the UK government to is their commitment to a three-hour journey time. It is possible to achieve that three-hour journey time with less than a full high-speed rail all the way to Edinburgh and Glasgow. But we have that ambition to have full high-speed um, rail all the way to Edinburgh and Glasgow. It is not possible to achieve it without some elements. And you mentioned either gradients or bends in certain parts, especially in the south of Scotland, especially in the West Coast Main Line. Uh, and that is where it comes in stretches of high-speed uh, rail, which allow high-speed trains to run at full speed if you're going to meet that three-hour journey time. Now, I say that's not the solution. There's a number of options, and I'm happy to furnish the committee, convener, if you, if you, if you want me to do that with the options that we currently have so you can see where the working is. Well, I think that, if I can, one more question. That, I think that would be great if we could get uh, something like that. And, and broadly speaking on finance, would it be the UK government would pay for anything from Manchester to Carlisle? and we would pay for any improvements between Carlisle and Glasgow and Edinburgh? Uh, the Scottish Government would uh, pay for it under current arrangements, and um, from the discussions that we've had, and they're not complete, it would likely be um, consequentials would flow from the monies which were spent south of the border, and we would expect to use those consequentials to pay for, uh, and perhaps additional monies to pay for uh, high-speed rail north of the border. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, sorry, uh, Stuart, yes. It's just a little question of, um, that relates to a previous UK government commitment. Uh, and when I say previous, I mean quite a long time ago on what is now HS1, uh, where part of the Channel Tunnel project promised that there'd be international trains run from both Glasgow and Edinburgh uh, through the tunnel. And indeed, the rolling stock was in fact purchased. Uh, but subsequently sold without any of these trains uh, uh, having run. So, uh, in considering that, has that subject returned again to part of the discussion between the governments? Because clearly the attraction of being able to get on a train in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and decant in Paris, uh, uh, Brussels, or as the new HS1 uh, route has uh, just started to uh, Amsterdam, it would be quite attractive and highly supportive for things like climate change rather than flying. Uh, as in many things, the member's memory is far longer than mine, but I do recall um, those, um, that rolling stock being bought, commitments being made and then being ditched pretty much overnight. I wouldn't say there's been um, a minister-to-minister -minister discussion on the issue I have raised with my officials, exactly the point that uh, the member mentions. Not just the, the attractiveness of being able to get on in Paris or Brussels to go to Edinburgh or Aberdeen, for example, but the ability to do so perhaps on a sleeper train, um, you know, would be very attractive for, for many people. It involves, as the member might be aware, even from the preliminary um, inquiries I've made of officials, um, some major uh, work, especially at St Pancras, um, in order to see how, not least with Brexit, how you facilitate immigration and things like that. But um, I think that would be um, a, a tremendous thing to see. But no, we're not involved in direct discussions with the UK government on that subject. Thank you. So we do now move to the next question, which is Mike. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to focus on uh, initial question on the route selection for the A96. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary, as well as myself and other members from the North East, were at a meeting with the Save Benicky campaigners, and so I know the Cabinet Secretary is very well aware of this issue, and they are saying that um, they're very concerned on the choice of the, the, as we approach the choice of the route, that they're concerned that desktop studies are going on, and only after a route is selected um, is a site study work done, and they would be very concerned that this is not sufficiently comprehensive to address all the issues in, in what they call a proper manner. So are they, are, are they right that this is the process that will be undergone? Is it, is it just um, desktop studies that are going on or is there a more, uh, is, is there site study work being done on each of these routes so that they get, so the decision makers, yourself, has, has all the information that's available to them? Can I just ask if that relates to the Benahi um, stretch, yes. that, that specific question? Yeah. yeah, I think there is much more work going on. As the, the member knows, we had, um, apart from anything else, that presentation from the action group I had hoped before now to go to 
visit the site itself, but I had to call off at the last minute, but that's getting rearranged in the diary so I can uh, see for myself uh, the particular issues around there. But there's also um, ground investigation, other work going on, perhaps in the process issue, it'd be best to hear from Michelle ra rather than me. But um, uh, certainly I want to, having heard, and not just heard when we met with them, along with yourself and others, but the representations that I received beforehand wanted to see more about that. They've also raised the issue of whether a, uh, what's called a co-creation process can be put in place. And we're looking at that just now. We've got one example uh, of having undertaken that on the A9 project. So we're looking at that, and that would represent far more than a desktop study. But it's perhaps best to hear from Michelle, convener, if that's OK. Uh, so there's a, there's a variety of different work happening right across the... the um, a96 uh, development. As uh, you'll appreciate, it's quite a complex, um, like with all of these schemes, it's it's quite a complex uh, programme and is reliant on um, detail about what happens locally. So whether that's about the topography of the land, the um, sites of special scientific interest, um, you know, uh, any, any particular features, uh, flooding, hydrological services, Surveys, the geology, a whole, a whole variety of things are taken into that mix. So whilst um, a desktop study might not appear on the face of it to be um, uh, sufficiently detailed to somebody who's not familiar with that kind of work, actually a, a phenomenal amount of information can be gained as a consequence of a desktop study. And that's not to say that the people who are involved in that work are not familiar with the, the landscape that they're dealing with, not familiar with the issues that that landscape involves. In the development of all of these projects, Transport Scotland um, and our uh, technical advisors, who are, you can imagine are, are pretty experienced in this kind of work, um, take a whole variety of factors into account in arriving at conclusion. And the process that we follow is the process that is outlined in the design manual for roads and bridges. So it's a, it's a, it's a best practice, if you like, in, in terms of the development of road schemes. And we follow that across all of our projects. If I could just follow Michelle's um, reply. I mean, I'm just, just, I'm surprised, I mean, as a lay person involved with this, um, that on all the projects that, because you're quite rightly taking a long time to decide on the most, or to recommend to the minister the most appropriate route, um, but it is surprising to the campaigners and people who are involved with this who want to protect the iconic Benahi, um, that it is being done by a, des a desktop. I mean, that is the st you're saying that's the standard practice that you, you always undertake when you're developing. It's just a surprising. That it is just surprising to me that um, that when you're making the final recommendation to the minister, that the teams haven't actually been out on on the routes themselves. The teams have been out so, on the routes. Um, so what do you mean by a desktop study then? Well, well uh, you know, I suppose that's that's what we call it. We produce we produce reports on the basis of all the information that's available to us. Um, and not only not only do we do that, we have we have a significant amount of engagement with um, local communities. And as you'll have heard in the cabinet secretary's speech, that involves actually speaking to thousands of people right across these routes. So you know, uh, it's I suppose. I suppose maybe the, the term desktop study is misleading because it suggests that something is happening in isolation in a darkened room almost, and, and that's not what's happening. There's a lot of engagement, there's a lot of knowledge gained about the area, uh, uh, but a lot, you know, some of that information is gained through reference to you know, um, details that are already there. Thank you very much, Connie. That, that's exactly what I wanted. It, that it just, I think the term, as you've just expressed, might give a wrong impression to to, to lay folk. So my final question in this area is both on the A9 and the A96. Um, are there any current known issues which could lead to delays in either of these projects? I think the Cabinet Secretary was saying that everything seems to be on track in your opening statement. Yeah, I think the, um, uh, there's, uh, the biggest um, uncertainty is always the issue of uh, public inquiries. And if you have a, quite a number of those, and that can start to extend the timelines. But the way that we've approached it, I think, and just to go back to the last point, I'd mentioned the opening statement, we had had over 1,001 and, uh, case and over 1,400 another case on the 96 in terms of public engagement. Part of the benefit of that is um, 
obviating, in a way, the need for public inquiries if the people consulted feel they've, they're happy with what's proposed. So if the extent to which we um, can minimise that, of course, it's a part of the democratic process and we always observe that, but if we can put enough information uh, out there that there, it doesn't result in a public inquiry, that helps. But they, they, that probably is always the biggest risk to public infrastructure projects, public inquiries. If you think back to the Bewley Denny power line, that was uh, the longest public inquiry in Scottish history. It lasted over a year. Uh, but we don't expect that, uh, based on our current projections, to affect the 2025 or 2030 opening dates. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Kate and then John and then Peter. So, Kate first. Um, on, on the A9, you mentioned the um, earlier in answer to Jamie Green around the uh, electric vehicle charging points. Are they being considered currently in as you're progressing with uh, the, the dueling project, or will that be a project uh, separate to um, the, the dueling? I can say I, I'd said I'd called it the Electric uh, Avenue. That shows my age. That was an old song by somebody called Eddie Grant. It was the Electric Highway. I think we're, we were talking about, um, and both things are being. Uh, uh, Michelle can come in about the work that's going to be done on that. But both things are being considered together. And just incidentally, on the A9, we're also looking to try and uh, capture the active travel route, which is there, which has not been well maintained in previous years, to make sure that's part of the future contract, so that it is well maintained. But I don't know if you want to. See that's more. right. The, the two things are being progressed in parallel. People presumably off the A9 and into some of those smaller villages that you mentioned down that highway. Depending on where the charging points are, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it, one last supplementary. Have you noticed any increase in traffic on the A82 with the dueling works going on on the A9? I'm afraid I'm not able to give you that information at the moment, but I'm, I'm quite so happy something to, you could supply. to supply you with Thank something you. afterwards. Yeah. Um, John. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, I, I think at a previous committee meeting, I raised the issue of the co-creative process with you, and indeed, I think I've, I've written and been grateful for the positive response I received. It's not necessarily reflected by, as I understand, the approach taken by Transport Scotland officials, who seem considerably less enthusiastic about that level of public engagement. Is it something that you would be, because uh, I know in response to Mr Rumbles, you, you suggested that might be an option for the stretch of road there. Of course, the frustration a lot of people have is that, notwithstanding their engagement, this is going to happen. Something's going to happen anyway. So, um, uh, your, your officials, should they be picking up more positively on this? Uh, well, engagement? to be fair, it was the officials that proposed this in the first place. Uh, that's where the suggestion came from, from Transport Scotland. Um, and the instance in which it's being used currently is the first time. So, we are trying to learn lessons from that. And I think it's true to say some things have taken longer to put in place than we expected, and we're quite keen not to uh, undermine the target dates that we have for these projects. But um, I, I would also say the instance where it's been done already is a part of the A9 which has, and this applies, I suppose, in, to some measure in, in nearly all of the A9, but uh, around Dunkeld, that area, the conflicts in terms of railways, in terms of communities, their use of roads, uh, on and off roads which are there, small villages and settlements next to it. It's a very complicated um, uh, series of challenges that we have and I think that's why it's well suited to um, a co-creative process so that people feel there's going to be some tough decisions at the end of it but they feel they've had their say and they've maybe changed the decisions based on what's come out through that. So I think we are to some extent feeling our way through this process and that seems to me to be the place where it's most appropriate where you have a number of large conflicts. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case uh, across the uh, A96 in different areas. It may be, and I have said, and I've said to Transport Scotland, they should maintain an open mind, but I have to say it was Transport Scotland that came up with this idea in the first place. But we do have to keep an eye, idea, an, uh, an eye on how long the process takes and try to make it as quickly as possible if we can do that. Can I? Yeah. It's, it's, about, it's not about whether you have a co-creative process or not so much. Um, if, if we need to have one, we'll, we need to have one. It's more about the timing of the co-creative process and where you can best use that kind of a process. And as Mr. Brown says, it's particularly useful 
we think, in the scenario um, we have on the A9 at the moment, although we, have, we, we still have to learn the lessons from, from that process, where we're at a much earlier stage of project development. Um, the advice that we're receiving is that it probably wouldn't be as useful at that point because actually we still have to go through the process that we're going through just now in order to arrive at a, at a preferred route option. If I may, it wasn't my intention to come in on this issue, but since the, the, the Cabinet Secretary offered that as an option to Mr Rumbles, I'm just concerned that what we are is there's a potential for tokenism here, and that what we're saying is there's, there's the possibility of this um, more in-depth uh, um, system of engagement, but we'll decide when it's appropriate. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the, the time imperatives, not least in respect of the contract, but also um, on another issue I've raised about roundabouts versus grade separated junctions, the, the overall journey, journey time imperative. But you either have meaningful engagement or you don't. And I would have thought some months on from the Dunkeld experience, we would be in a better position to understand the benefits or perhaps otherwise of that system. Perhaps um, if you could have a, a longer conversation about why it's taken longer than it's expected, including the appointment of consultants and some of the reasons behind that um, stretching out, that would give a great understanding. But it's not a question of uh, you're either for engagement or you're not. Engagement's carried out in a number of ways. So the public exhibitions which are held, which are very well attended, they're very open, they're open to anybody. Uh, a lot of people get the information they need from that. Um, I think uh, in the case of Dunkeld, there was a particular series, complicated series, of um, conflicts, if you like, there. That's why we found it to be appropriate. And I think it's not unreasonable to say this is the first time we've done it. We want to learn lessons from it. And it's not a prejudice against doing it again. If you think it's appropriate to do that, or if another level of engagement, say through public engagements, uh, public exhibitions, uh, and discussions in community meetings, isn't the right way to do it, if it's not enough, then of course we keep that as an option. But we, we, we should have the ability to learn the lessons from what we've done so far, I think. Peter, you want to come in? Yeah, uh, uh, Fairly detailed questions, maybe Michelle's uh, uh, remit. It's, it's about the A96. Is, is the option Q still uh, on the table, which is the one that kind of goes via Old Meldrum and uh, would, would obviously help the Aberdeen Banff Road would, uh, as a consequence of, of, of looking at that route? Is that option still on the table or has that been ruled out? Because I heard it had been ruled out. Um, I I can't give you an update on precisely what options are still here at this moment in time, but I'm happy to write to the committee and provide that detail. Okay, okay we'll leave that there. Uh, and the, John Finney, yours is the next question. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we, we looked at existing projects and discussed some past projects. I, I would like to ask uh, some questions, please, around the Strategic Transport Projects Review. And uh, I understand from my papers here that uh, Transport Scotland issued a contract notice <coughs> excuse me, on the 10th of May. Are you able to set out the timescale for this exercise and how Parliament would become involved, please? Uh, that would be for um, Michelle to answer it. So I, that is a uh, convener in uh, Hamza Yusuf's uh, remit. And I think the committee asked him about that as recently as last week. But um, So it's, it's Hamza that will take that forward, not myself. The major transport projects for which I'm responsible are the ones if you like, I was responsible for previously and continuing those until they're completed, but transport is uh, Hamza Yusuf's area. But do you want to come back on that, Michelle? Um, we anticipate that um, the uh, next Strategic Transport Projects Review will be available in uh, 2020, and I think a commitment has been made to completing it within the lifetime of this Parliament, so we're, we're still on track to making that happen. It will happen in parallel with the national transport strategy. There is a significant amount of um, consultation going on with, um, with, with both, actually. Um, and uh, we're, still, we're still on track with all of that. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, forgive me, I'm a bit confused here then. Um, <clears throat> we'll only be in a position to, if you like, retrospectively question you on issues. You, you, you couldn't comment on future major projects. What I'm saying is the, I'm responsible for a series of the major projects, so the fourth crossing, the A9, A96, um, M8 bundle previously, Presswick Airport. Transport generally is the remit of the Minister for Transport and he will have um, the responsibility for the STPR going forward. That's the only point I was, I was making there. 
Okay. So, so some confusion. I, I get confused. Uh, I, I share John's confusion over major transport projects. Major transport projects, Cabinet Secretary, still fall under you, or do they fall under? Which I've mentioned, I think, a number of times previously to the committee, the specific projects which I've mentioned, major projects other than that come under the remit of uh, Hamza Youssef. I think I did offer previously, and I think we did write to the committee with that clarification, but I'm happy to do so again, convener. So, I mean, what would be helpful as major transport projects are identified is that the committee knows who is responsible for them, because yeah. it may be that some of those are passed to you. Yeah. I think that would be helpful yeah. to, to, to know. Just so to I'm going to bring sorry. Gail in and I'll come. Uh, sorry, John, do you want to come back on that? Well, I, I had a whole series of questions for you, Cabinet Secretary. You'd be devastated to know I'm... Um, um, uh, that, uh, um, can I maybe make it a, a more political level then? I mean, the, the Cabinet cl clearly has, has a number of priorities. There's priorities around uh, the climate change. The, there's issues around low-carbon infrastructure, which... Um, um, and part of the government's commitment was to establish a just transition committee. Now, we talked about the electric vehicles and the, the um, A9. I'm trying to understand how all the issues come together. And uh, I understand demarcations in portfolios. But for instance, we'll give you an example. Um, if, 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 and I appreciate this isn't your portfolio, but if, if we have um, a commitment with trains that are diesel for 15 years, but Scott Rail are quite rightly trying to future-proof any upgrades of car parks with electric vehicles, and the government has a challenge, uh, has a, a commitment around that, then you're going to have people perhaps plugging in electric vehicles at a station with a, a, a diesel, which would be rolled out uh, elsewhere, um, pulling up at that station with a commitment. It seems there's an awful lot of things that have to come together, and whilst accepting that this might not have manifested itself into individual major projects, which we can discuss with you in the future. Are you able to discuss how that will be pulled together? Yeah, certainly. Um, first of all, um, I should say that the STPR covers far more than major projects. There's a very large number of much more minor projects, and it's, it's uh, Hamza Yosef that's taken that forward. Um, and you mentioned, the uh, member mentioned the Just Transition Group. Well, because I have responsibility for trade unions, I am involved in discussions with the trade unions about Just, just Transition, um, which, uh, in case other members might be unaware, is just the transition between um, very labour-intensive industries and automation, moving them to much less labour-intensive and making sure that transition is as um, fair and um, as effective as possible for people involved in it. But yes, the discussions that we have, um, certainly at Cabinet, so uh, the climate change targets, um, the environmental legislation being brought forward by Rosanna Curium, that will have benefited from discussion amongst all Cabinet Secretaries beforehand and will have covered things, just as you've mentioned, you know, electric charging points at, uh, I mean, it, on a, if you like, a bigger scale, how many we would intend to do or what the prevalence of electric charging points should be or the electric highway idea. So these things are considered together um, and they're considered a cabinet. I'm just making the point that the responsibilities for them being taken forward are, uh, in this case, with uh, Fergus Ewing and, and Rosanna Cunningham. In relation to the diesel trains, I, if this is what the member's asking, of course, with the electrification of the Edinburgh to Glasgow line and the introduction of um, electric trains there, there will be a rollout of some of the diesel stock to other parts of the country. Um, sometimes that would be more efficient di diesel stock um, and of course the ability to have just electric trains on the network really requires us to electrify the entire network and that would take uh, some time and some money to put it uh, mildly but we, we of course have the ambition to get as much of the um, network electrified as possible and in my own area for example both Stirling and Alloa, uh, Dunblane uh, are substantial progress has been made, but it's also true in shots and, and other parts of the country as well. We've, we've, we've had that electrification. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Richard. Yeah, I just want to get a handle too. You're responsible for ongoing contracts. You know, they make bundle all the different other things, big contracts. Who decides the future big contracts, like a new bypass in, in Ayrshire, a new road going to Stranraer, um, you know, we've now completed uh, MA, Queen's Ferry Crossing, AWPR, all the A9. So what's the next big project that you can take care of and complete on time and on budget? 
Uh, who decides? The First Minister decides. So um, uh, that's but, uh, the large scale uh, transport projects, with the exception of the ones which I've mentioned, which I've answered questions on previously to this committee a number of times, are the responsibility for Hamza Youssef as the Transport Minister and uh, Fergus Ewing at Cabinet level. So the, the projects which I'm responsible for are the ones. By and large, I think because the First Minister saw I had been involved with them for a number of years beforehand and seeing those through to completion. You mentioned the Emmett Bundle, the A9, uh, the A96, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, Presswick Airport, because I've been involved in that previously. So those, those are the projects for which I'm responsible. New projects and the contracts which go along with them. That's right. Thank you. Thanks. So just on that point, all the major roads projects that we've discussed today are in the north of Scotland, and that's fantastic news for that part of Scotland. But you can, you can travel from Inverness on trunk roads for 200 miles south um, and not, not see a, a village or a town or have to drive through them until you hit Ayrshire or Dumfries and Galloway. And if you're travelling to the, the, the busiest ferry port in Scotland at Cairn Ryan, you'll have to travel through village after village after village after village at 30 mile an hour to get to that area. And you know from your, your, your role as Economy Secretary, the massive impact that has on the economy of the south of Scotland. It's the lowest paid economy uh, part, of, part of the country. So at, at what point do you get involved as, as the Economy Secretary to make sure the economic case for the A77 or the A75 is taken into account when it comes to determining what the future strategic roads are, given the lack of investment in these roads over, over many years? Uh, well, I would refute that. Um, I think you're right to say, as I think Patrick McLaughlin once said, that the problem with the transport infrastructure in Scotland is it's not had investment for decades. Uh, he was speaking, I think, three or four years ago, but speaking as somebody who was a transport minister back in 1989, and I think that it's right to say there's a legacy of underinvestment. And if you just heard the litany of different projects for which we were responsible, including, for example, the Borders Railway, the biggest piece of rail infrastructure or rail line built in the UK for over 100 years, I don't think it's true to say that the south of Scotland is not featured uh, in those things. Also, the Mabel uh, bypass plan, uh, plans, the Dalry bypass, the work that's been carried out at uh, Dunraggett, um, so there has been work that's carried out, but the future projects will be those taken forward by the Transport Minister. But of course, in terms of the economic impact, there's a much wider discussion. So the South of Scotland Enterprise Partnership and what will become the South of Scotland Agency will be involved in that. And we all, um, as um, Cabinet members, we've all met um, uh, previously in the South of Scotland, we've heard representations, we're all party to those decisions. But um, in terms of transport projects, it will be taken forward by the transport portfolio with Hamza Youssef and uh, Fergus Ewing. Can I, can I just add to that? Michelle. We've also yeah. recently commenced the West of Scotland transport study, and um, the output from that will be included in um, STPR2. Gail. Thank you, convener. Yeah, I just wanted to um, get clarification on um, why this is happening. Is this review something that would have been happening anyway as part of you know, your, your governmental term, or has something prompted it? STPR2. Yes. Yeah. We, we, um, we, we undertook a review in 2008, STPR1, and that review recommended 29 uh, strategic transport interventions at that time. Those interventions have largely been delivered or are in the process of being delivered. So um, because of that, and because I suppose the world has moved on from then, now seems like the right time to look at what our future national transport strategy is and on the back of that identifying you know what what the strategic transport projects uh, going forward ought to be and that will be considered across a, a, mo a multi-modal um, function including buses active travel ferries you know r right across the range it'll consider everything and um, again, just a point of clarification, am I right in saying that uh, when you go on to duel the rest of the A9 up to Scrabster, it'll be Mr Yusuf and Mr Ewing that I'll have to interact with for that? I think I'll let them answer that question, convener, if I can. But of course you'll know about the work that we intend to do at the Berrydale Brace. Yeah. Um, briefly, John and, and, and Jamie. So, John, if it's a brief question. Yes, yeah, thank you. I, I, you know, I, I get that the responsibility you have is at the more strategic level, but... Um, 
how do you address the understandable concerns that are the length and breadth of the country that whilst the, perhaps the major infrastructure is um, being enhanced all around it, uh, the other infrastructure, which I accept, you'll tell me, is the responsibility of local authorities, is not being <coughs> maintained, repaired or replaced. Surely there becomes a tipping point where all the benefits of having, if you would view them as benefits of having jewelled roads, are going to be lost if everything off it is of substand. <coughs> Um, I, I do have to meet your expectations and say that, of course, it's not just um, a political division of responsibility, it's a legal one. Uh, local authorities are the roads authorities. Um, so when I was a local authority leader, if the government had come in and said, we're going to do this for this road, I'd probably say, yes, thanks for the money, but we'll take control of that because we're the responsible roads authority. There are there are sometimes um, distinctions there. So part of the proposed proposals in the Ayrshire Growth Deal are for us to be involved in a, a road which is not our road, um, and also one that you may be familiar with yourself, the Long One Roundabout. Part of that uh, project is not in the uh, Scottish Government's um, remit, but we are working with local authorities. I've previously made as a Transport Minister the offer to local authorities where they have. I think just an example you've given of, say, a dual carriageway or major road butting onto local roads, as it will inevitably do, that we should look to jointly work uh, in those areas as well and uh, made an open invitation to councils to come forward to the Scottish Government if they want to do that. That was some time ago, and it's obviously some time since I've been Transport Minister, so I don't know the extent to which that's progressed. But that offer is there uh, to local authorities for that joint working. And I think what's really quite encouraging in some areas I think, again, the Ayrshire's is the uh, willingness of local authorities to work together across our boundaries to more effectively look after the roads. 96% of the roads in Scotland are local authority roads, uh, but 4% are Scottish Government controlled roads. Thank you, Convener. Uh, in our committee papers, we have a very helpful table provided uh, around snagging works in the Queensway Crossing. It details the work item uh, of an ongoing or planned work, and it has a target date. Uh, we appreciate it's perhaps an estimated date. Um, I put in a freedom of information request for the same piece of information for the M8, M73, M74. I was helpfully given half the table and a list of works, but my request for target dates uh, was met with the response that the Scottish Government did not have the information uh, that I requested and therefore they refused my request under FOI. Could you explain uh, why you have it for the Queen's Ferry Crossing but not the other piece of infrastructure project? And would you consider producing a, uh, a list of target dates for the snagging works on that piece of road? Uh, I think it's best if I let Tim Michelle answer that. Um, I suppose to, to put it most simply, the uh, two projects are let on quite different forms of contract and um, there are different requirements in, in each form of contract. Uh, we can only give you information that we hold. The contractor on the M8 has told us that uh, he intends to complete the works, the, any outstanding works this summer, but he hasn't given us a detailed breakdown of how he intends to complete those works. Um, I'm going to relent, Stuart. I'm, I may regret it, I hope not. Stuart, a, a short question from you. It, it is short. I just wondered if, in project management terms, it would be normal for the government to have access to the work breakdown structure that is an integral and very detailed part of the project management system. We tend to have access to, um, I suppose, what you would call a strategic programme on, on these major projects, uh, where there are uh, effectively fairly minor works, it would be less likely for us to have that information. And actually, the contractor needs the flexibility to be able to move his resources around the site as weather conditions and resource allows. I just come back to being, I can just say to the previous discussion that we've had at this committee about the nature of contracts and the extent to which you want to be prescriptive. You can be endlessly prescriptive and you can also work to absolutely minimise risk, but you'll see the cost of projects starting to go up and perhaps the willingness of contractors to come forward to bid for them reduce as well. So we do have to try, strike a balance. Always willing to look at how we, we, we do that, but we do have to give um, contractors, we found that the balance that we have just now of giving them that discretion is very important. Queen's Ferry Crossing was um, funded in a very different way, of course, with uh, direct government funding. Um, but, uh, and, and finally, to say we can't release information that we don't have, obviously. 
Cabinet Secretary, thank you. That neatly leads on to the question that I have regarding your experience of major contracts uh, that you've mentioned already today. I mean, a lot of these contracts are overseen by partnership or joint ventures, uh, which then rely on subcontractors, in many cases, small uh, SME businesses. Um, do you feel that those businesses actually are getting a, a good deal and are probably, are, are they benefiting from the government's business pledge in 2015 to make sure that their invoices are promptly paid or do you think they're not getting a good deal? I think we have, uh, the government has a very good record uh, of paying um, promptly where we've, we've got the responsibility to do so. Sometimes, of course, that's done by local authorities. I'm aware of a couple of particular instances where it's been three or four days late, that's happened. But I think generally we've got a very good uh, track record in ensuring prompt payment. And I think also there is investigation of project bank accounts as a means of trying to uh, further improve that. There's also a lot of discussion about blockchain technology, if that can be used to make it more efficient and effective. So I, I think we have a good track record in relation to that. And the business pledge where it's down for individual um, uh, companies uh, to sign up to that, then they have to look to their, that's part of the business pledge, as you mentioned, the payment terms. I think beyond that, you, you brought a question about whether SMEs are getting, if you like, a fair crack of the whip. I think we've been conscious that going back many years now, that some of the contracts which have been let by previously the Scottish Executive or the Scottish Government are, are of such a scale that the financial and legal expertise that's required um, is beyond the ability of certainly say construction, small construction companies to take on. And we're very keen to see if there's any more we can do to make sure they don't feel precluded from doing that. And as I mentioned before, the AWPR, if it's the case that even previously big players like Carillion um, or Balfour BT or Gallifer try, don't want to go forward uh, on their own, then it's very unlikely SMEs are going to uh, attempt that. So, and I think that's one thing that argues for the 12 phases of the A9 rather than one huge project as well. So um, we're trying to do these things by framework agreements, but I mentioned previously after the Carillion uh, situation, which much of which we don't control, it's down to company law, down to pensions regulation and so on as well, that we do want to have, and I've asked Transport Scotland to have a further look about what we can do to maximise, it's not just the involvement, where I think we've got very good involvement of SMEs, but it's the power relationship between the subcontractor and the main contractor that's, I think, of particular interest. Um, and within that, there are particular issues like retentions, and which are always being discussed. So we are looking to do more, but I think 78%, if that was a figure that was previously mentioned, um, is, is uh, indicative of the efforts that have been made so far, but I'm sure there's more we can do. I, I, I mean, I'm just concerned. I understand that, that SMEs can't necessarily compete with joint ventures that are put together, but they often work for the joint ventures uh, that are awarded the contract. And, and whereas the government will pay the joint venture, Sometimes SMEs, I suspect, might have to wait a long time, well with outside the business pledge that, that the government has signed up to. Are you comfortable with that, or, or, or do you think there's more work you could do on that? We, we've, we've all, in Transport Scotland, on our major projects, we have included bank, project bank accounts in all of those uh, major projects. So that it goes some way towards um, reducing the, the amount of time that it takes for uh, SMEs to get paid once the initial payment is made by the government. We've also, on the A9, looked at what work that we can award directly to SMEs. Um, and uh, with that in mind, we have um, procured a, a framework contract for um, smaller works, for accesses, for demolition, for utility works, and some for some preparatory works. That has a variety of benefits. It helps us to de-risk the main contracts, particularly where those are seasonal works, and they're affected by things like bird nesting season. Um, and it also gives um, direct payment to SMEs without there being anybody between Scottish Government payment and, and the SME directly receiving it. We'll continue to look at where we can intervene um, in, in that way for all of our major contracts. And we also continue to, and we ask our main contractors on a regular basis to give us details of any issues that are arising with SMEs. But 
more widely, we see a variety of subcontractors working across all of our major projects. So whilst I appreciate that some SMEs do have difficulties, one can only presume that others are benefiting as a result of these major projects because of their repeated involvement. Okay, I'm going to push you, Cabinet Secretary. Are you happy that the government is doing enough to help SMEs in, in the, when they are subcontracting to joint ventures? I think I've said a couple of times, not least since the collapse of Carillion, that I've asked uh, Transport Scotland to look at what more we can do, and we'll continue to. It's never the case. I think you're satisfied with all that's been done. I think you have to continue to look at that, that the situation uh, changes in any event. The, the collapse of Carillion has changed the situation. So, no, we always have to look at what more we can do. I'm sorry, my final question, just on joint ventures. Sometimes the assets of the joint ventures that are set up to run these contracts don't uh, exceed um, the, the, sorry, are less than the money that they're being paid. So if the joint venture falls, there aren't enough sufficient uh, funds there to, to pay the SMEs. Do you feel that, they, that you've got that in hand and that's not an issue that can happen? We have... Um uh, in, since, since we've been alerted to the Carillion situation, we have um, altered our uh, financial checks on companies so that we are doing financial checks much more frequently to ensure that that situation doesn't arise. I guess the proof will be in the pudding is, is, is as, as these projects are, are delivered. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you very much, Michelle, for coming to the committee today. I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow the changeover of witnesses.
to move the uh, committee back into session and move on to a, agenda item two, which is the annual report. This relates to the committee's consideration of our draft annual report. The report covers the work of the committee during the parliamentary year between the 12th of May, May 2017 and the 11th of May 2018. Now, I would like to invite any comments anyone has. Uh, Mike, you want to go? Thanks, convener, and it's quite good that we're discussing our draft report in, in public session because we normally discuss draft reports in private session and so the public get an idea of what we're talking about when we do look at draft reports. So, if I can start on page three, um, when we talk about meetings, and in it, it says in the second sentence, in general, items taken in private were to consider the committee's work programme, approach papers and draft reports. I'm just wondering whether uh, we could be more specific rather than say in general, because in fact, as far as I'm aware, we only take items in private, which are the committee's work program, approach papers and draft reports. So it just remove the first two words of that sentence? Um, yes, I mean, I think we had, uh, we've had informal meetings, so I think, but yes, I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go through your mics and then I'm gonna come to you, if I may, John. Yeah, Mike, do you have any other no, no, that's fine. Okay, John. Um, thank you, Kavira, and, and, and thanks as ever to our, our valued staff for, the, for their work in this. Um, it, it was just simply in relation to the, the, the heading, um, convener, implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the European Union, and uh, my well-documented frustrations about our inability to hear from the UK government on that. I think just as it's there, um, and I'm sure members will have a diplomatic form of wording, but I think we, we should say that we we remain hopeful of hearing from the UK government or something um, of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it would be appropriate to ask committees to draft something to reflect the requests we've made uh, for meetings, yes. Thank you. Uh, Stuart. Um, paragraph 31 on page 10. Um, in the light of the evidence we've just heard um, in the last line, uh, cabinets, th this is in relation to the AWPR, uh, we should inc add the word late before autumn 2016. Yep. Uh, that's my first point. Um, second point. There's some dispute about that because the cabinet secretary said he said this in. But the question was that he actually didn't say late when he made his statement on the 22nd of March. He said it today. But there's two things. First of all, we need to look at the actual wording that he used in the previous yeah. report, and anything that was said today is out with the reporting period. So, uh, well, if I may, you know, what the minister, the cabinet minister, secretary said was that he had said in his statement to Parliament late, rather than his saying it. I, I, I'm not in a position because I've not explored the official report. I'm only, I'm only making the point that's what he said today. Check but with the clerk the official report and, and reflect what it says in the official it, report. It, it, I don't want to make a big no. issue of it. I just, Thank you. But let me move on, if I may, to uh, paragraph 49. Um, I, I just think the grammar is slightly uh, a further session on public transport representatives. I think it probably means a public session with public transport representative. Is that correct? I'm getting nodding, nodding heads there. And uh, I go to paragraph 50, um, which is under the heading equalities. Um, committee mainstreamed equalities issues throughout its work in the parliamentary year. That's correct. I'm not sure that the for example is appropriate at the beginning of the next session because I don't think that was about mainstreaming. That was a very specifically focused thing on, on equalities rather than about mainstreaming. But, you know, I'm open to others' views on that subject. We'll look at the wording for that. Yeah, that'd be fine. Oh, sorry, I have. I've missed one. Um, paragraph 41, um, the committee subsequently took from and then it doesn't say, I think it means took evidence from. Uh, Gail. 
Thank you, Convener. Yes, um, as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, we are um, quite adamant that human rights should be mainstreamed throughout all the other committees as well. So I would quite like it if we could see um, under the Equalities heading another heading on human rights and how we've mainstreamed those through the work that we've done as well. Thank you. Yes, we'll do that. Any other comments? Jamie. Thank you, Convener. I'll try and keep them brief. Uh, page two, uh, paragraph two. Um, I wondered if, uh, when we list the matters that the committee covers, if we could include uh, after transport uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Obviously, we heard from the Cabinet Secretary today uh, on a number of uh, infrastructure projects, which I think differentiate itself from the transport brief, uh, if that's okay. Um, uh, can I just come in on that, Convener? Um, I, I think, and the clerks can advise, that what is said there is the formal form of words that reflect the motion that Parliament passed in establishing the committee. Um, the clerks are explaining to me that, that it, it doesn't, uh, they, they think it's a reflection of our remit, it's not a formal wording, so I think that we could put right. major transport I'm infrastructure content. in. Um, I mean, transport would cover major and minor. So if, if we're saying, are we saying transport brackets including both minor and major projects? Or, because the word transport includes everything we did today yeah. and everything we did with Hamza Yusuf. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the correct wording, if you're right, to reflect the fact that it does both major and minor infrastructure projects. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very relaxed about the wording. I just wanted to include the concept. Redrafting. Uh, page eight, uh, inquiries. Um, I wonder if it's worth noting in the similar vein that we talked about uh, <coughs> the UK government's representation to uh, provide uh, evidence sessions. I wonder if it's worth in this section commenting that we did ask retailers who are a substantial part of the salmon industry to appear, but that none uh, chose to accept that invitation, if that's worth commenting on in the report. It, is the committee happy to do that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, page 11, uh, uh, paragraph 37, review of legislation on small landholders in Scotland. Uh, I notice, and perhaps I'm missing it, but nowhere in the our report does it mention crofting. Uh, I wondered if there was a reason for that. We did take evidence, uh, a lot of evidence this year on, on the subject matter, but nowhere do we refer to any work that we've done on that subject. And I wonder if this is a, perhaps a good place to include it. Uh, I'd, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll ask the clerks to double check that. It is in paragraph two that we've taken evidence on it, but I think the evidence that we took on crofting mainly fooled, fell in the previous year. But we'll double check, and if, if it doesn't, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure it's reflected in the report. Thank you. The, the years do tend to roll into one uh, uh, convener, but thank you for, for clarifying. Um, and. Uh, a minor one on uh, page 14, uh, uh, paragraph 49, on engagement innovation. I think this was around one of our uh, live streaming sessions, which was very useful. Um, Facebook Live allowed the public to comment directly as evidence was taken. I, I, I would just like to perhaps change that to something around uh, a suggestion of Facebook Live allowed the public to provide commentary via Facebook as evidence was being provided. In other words, that comment was not part of the formal proceedings or did not input directly into our deliberations. I think that's right. And uh, my final point is on the next page, page 15, on equalities. I think just to back up what Gil Ross was saying around the, uh, uh, the work that committees do to improve accessibility uh, to the work that we do, I, I wondered if it was worth noting that none of the committee's public sessions or, or public meetings were indeed either live subtitled or BSL interpreted. Um, however, the, the, annual, uh, the official report retrospectively does make written uh, uh, accounts of the meeting, um, but I, I think there's a, a comment to be made around our perhaps lack of accessibility to many members of the public, and I, that's direct feedback I got from a, a session with members of that community uh, in recent weeks. Um, do other members of the committee have a view on that? I, I would probably like to know more, convener, because I think the point Jamie makes sounds a perfectly valid one. Um, but 
I, I think the point being made is that there is the official printed report, but of course that's not accessible to everyone, um, and there is subtitling. And I would want to kind of know where are the gaps, because doing it in real time would be a very, very substantial commitment that might not be proportionate, and I'd like to understand to what, what, what the real need is. I, I, John, sorry. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with the point that Jamie's making, and I think Stuart's reiterated that maybe that's something we should consider. Whether we put that in the annual report, I don't know, because if we, if we start putting in everything in the annual report that we didn't do, um, it could become quite lengthy. Can I, can I make a suggestion to the committee? I think that it, it's a valid point that Jamie raises, and it's something that would be appropriately raised at the conveners group meeting when we discuss it across all the committees in the parliament. Um, to try and find out if there's a way to resolve that. So it, I think rather than actually put it in this report, if the committee would be happy that I raise it with the other conveners in the parliament at the next appropriate meeting. Um, is everyone happy with that? Thank you. Um, are there any other comments? Uh, usually when, uh, and I'm saying this for uh, people watching this, usually when the committee considers a report, we go through it on a, a page by page, line by line basis. Well, my question really is that you have made observations on it and one or two uh, members of the committee have made uh, comments, uh, other comments which we will include in the report. Uh, is the committee happy, subject to the changes that have been raised today, uh, that I, once those changes have been made, uh, put the report out in the committee's name? Okay, that's agreed. Thank you. The final item, therefore, on the agenda is agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation to do with plant health export. Just for completeness, I would like to make a declaration before we consider this that I am a member of a farming partnership, but I do not export uh, plants or seed to my knowledge. So I'm just making that observation. Uh, Peter. That's subject I will follow your lead convener and say that I am also a partner in a farming business, but I likewise don't get involved in export and seeds in any way. Okay. So this is consideration of agenda, uh, the item three, which is one negative instrument concerning the export of plants. No motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? That is agreed, and that therefore concludes today's committee business, and I now close the meeting. Thank you.